One of the deals that I angel invested in, you know, was a company I met on TikTok, actually of all places. Um, you might have heard of them. It's called Copy AI. Oh, so, yeah, you invested in yeah, Copy wait, AI. Wait, wait, that's a double. Yeah, move. we've definitely heard of them. Yeah, their baby food's actually really good. I would taste test that stuff. And it's like really, really good. <laughs> you stuff. would taste this? You yeah. Taste baby food. It's so good. I'm swearing. So, how are you comparing it? Like, what are you comparing it to? Applesauce. Like applesauce. Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually. <laughs> it's like, yeah. We called a timeout and you know, you're supposed to stop the clock. Yeah. Uh, the scoreboard operator didn't stop the clock. The ref was like, hey, you know, you got to stop the clock, you know, and the scoreboard operator was like, got up and was like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Appreciate it. I'm super excited to be here. I know you, you know, I met you um, literally, you know, at a Warriors basketball game. You're a Warriors so. fan too, right? I'm a Warriors yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Born and raised. Dude, the night I met you was so jarring. I was with uh, Imran and Labib yep. and it was, I think, Ami's uh, kind of event at that one house. Yeah. I remember the first thing that happened is I walk in and this guy kind of walks by me. I'm like, I've seen him before. I don't really know where. And then five minutes later, some guy rushes up to me and he's like, dude, did you see who just walked by us? I'm like, no, who? He points out the guy. I'm like, I've seen him before. Who is he? He's like, that's Addison Ray's dad. And I was just what? confused. Wait, where were you? Uh, Ami had thrown it like an event. in Venice. Yeah. Oh. In Venice. Okay. You know, on the topic of events. So I heard from someone that Brex puts on around 200 events a year. Yes, 200 events. So our goal for next year is 200 events. Okay. Right now, I believe, you know, this year, um, we've done about 150-ish events. But how? If there are yeah. 52 weeks in a year and each one of these dinners is like, you know, it's, it's insane to put on. Yeah. How does that even happen? It's, it's hard. So our team is four people right now. One, two in Miami, one me in SF, and then my boss, Shai, he is in New York. So all four of us are doing collective, you know, 200 events. So, you know, that's what, like 50 events, you know, per person wow. a year, which is hard, you know. Um, it's definitely, you know, we launched something about, three months ago called these things called Breck Supper Clubs. You know, we used to do a lot of dinners in restaurants. You know, my go-to was like, you know, your palm houses, you know, super laid back, very casual, bring in founders. But, you know, as more events are happening, you know, it's like you have a higher bar for like, what events do I want to go to? You know, for me, you know, there's a lot of events I'm like, I don't want to go to. It's a waste of my time. Or, you know, you network with the same people. Yeah. So we wanted to do this thing called Breck Supper Club, which is, you know, dinners and in intimate dinners in people's houses. It's, you know, 12 to 20 people dinners in like a startup founder's home or like a venture capitalist's home. And it's a very unique vibe because, you know, it's not like, oh, you go to a restaurant, it's very, you know, like, you know, restaurant, you know, it's like very feels like a restaurant vibe versus this is just, you know, you're in someone's house, casual conversations, mm -hmm. you get to meet cool people. And usually at all these events, the whole takeaway is, you meet some really cool people. You hopefully talk to them. It's SF. It's small. You talk to them. You see them at multiple events. And, you know, it, the rest is history. But in terms of, yeah, throwing, you know, like 200 events in the year, it's a kind of mix. You know, there's, you know, dinners that we throw. We throw a lot of bigger, you know, events like happy hours. Um, next week, we're doing one um, for Techstars Founder Con, which is like a bigger, you know, happy hour for all of the attendees there. There's also like virtual events, you know, we do virtual webinars, seminars on, you know, founder education, such as how to raise, you know, if you're a first time founder, you know, you don't know anything about that or what is venture debt, you know, Brex, we do venture debt. Not a lot of people, myself included, knows a lot about venture debt. So it's like putting on events like that is super, super helpful. So it's definitely, you know, there's a lot of burnout, you know, it's like event, you know, there's like, you know, community managers in a sense has a lot of, you know, that community manager burnout. It's like, how do you basically, you know, be able to do all these events at one time and, you know, be able to do it consistently? You know, mm -hmm. I felt it before. It's like, yo, I'm burnt out. I don't want to do any more events. Yeah. But, you know, over time, it's like you do an event, you meet people and you're like, oh, shit, I'm energized again. You know, it's time to roll. It's time to do more events. In the community, there's like this really big kind of like hype around Brex events. There's like these big wait lists. It's hard to get into them. But even before that, Brex is essentially a corporate spending account or credit card for startups. Is that how you would pitch it? Yeah, pretty much. You know, how I perceive Brex is, you know, Brex is an all-in-one finance tool for startups, you know, going from everywhere, you know, um, as a day one founder to, you know, a post-IPO founder, you know, we have products for you. 
you know, there's Brex Cash, you know, for early stage founders, you know, once you raise, you get onto, you know, Brex Card, which is, you know, your credit cards. We just bought this company called Pry about, you know, the beginning of the year, which is, you know, like spend management platforms, you know, um, tools to, it's like kind of like an outsourced CFO tool, you know? Mm. So, you know, that's around, you know, when founders are like their seed series A, you know, looking at metrics, runway, sales, all that fun stuff. And then we also have Empower, which is, you know, for later stage companies. Do you know what the first like MVP of Brex was? Yeah. So, um, I learned this during orientation. So Brex started out as a VR company. So not even credit cards. Um, The founders started off as a VR company, you know, doing stuff in the VR space, realized, you know, it wasn't that viable. And one of their biggest obstacles was the fact that, you know, they were both from Brazil and there wasn't much credit cards for startups available out there. You know, it's like a lot of them, you know, were tied to your personal account, you know, personal guarantees. So they decided, hey, let's, you know, create this product. Our first MVP for Brex is, you know, the 30-day card, which is a credit card that is not tied to really, you know, a personal guarantee. It's based on, you know, how much you've raised and help founders, you know, kind of, you know, create this next, you know, generation of, you know, these card management companies that, you know, after Brex, you know, you have your Mercury's, your Ramps and all these, you know, coming into the space as well. So you would, so essentially what one thing that we've kind of talked about before is like this concept of category kings, right? Like, let's say the iPad is the category king in terms of tablets, iPhone in terms of smartphones, although I'm sure Android users would disagree. So one thing I'm, I'm kind of curious about is, would you say that Brex kind of created the category or would you say that it, you know, kind of took a category that maybe Amex or all these other credit card companies had already created and then just like did it a little better? Yeah, I think, you know, the second, you know, they did it a little better. You know, I don't, it's really hard, in my opinion, for, you know, startups to come create a whole new category. You know, everything, you know, we see in the space is, you know, usually someone trying to disrupt the space, you know, they see something wrong with it, they want to create something better. You know, what, you know, Brex has done really well, it's, you know, taken off, you know, from like, you know, your SVBs, you know, your AMXs, your chases of the days where, Business banking, business credit cards wasn't great. You know, it's like such old antiquated processes for for especially this new generation, you know, that wants great UI, great access, you know, things at your fingertips on your phone. You know, what Brex, what a lot of these newcomers are building, I think, is something that's going to be here to stay for a while. And then why do you think that Brex specifically um, has or like Brex and even the founders have kind of join this category of startups that are almost put on a pedestal in, in, in SF? Yeah, I really think, you know, a lot of it, A, you know, we, you know, we started in SF, you know, we were headquartered in SF. I never saw that because, you know, when I was, you know, when they were starting off, I was in college, so didn't know too much about Brex or anything or saw, you know, the evolution of Brex in San Francisco. But, you know, from what I heard back in the day, you know, we had a Brex cafe you know, in yeah. South Park. So it's it, like Capital One, Capital One had a, they have the exactly like, like the Westfield. Capital One cafe. Yeah. So it was, you know, if you had a Brex card, you had access to the second floor, like lounge, mm, which it's I like thought Magnesis. was so, Remember the fire festival guys, yeah. startup Magnesis, yeah. the credit card and they had the, the, the exclusive space. So things like that, you know, we did like the, a lot of billboards in San Francisco as well, you know, in the early days. And then now oh, I know, I, you saw this. <laughs> I never saw those billboards. I'm no, sure I'm you saying because so high rec yeah. did the exact same model. That's how I know him. Yeah. Just like from, <sighs> so when I yeah. was, I mean, I, I kind of had mentioned the story before, but we met at an event and then I was in India a few weeks later and I just see high rec plastered everywhere. You go to Berkeley, you just see the, every single bus stop yeah. just has high rec. And I sent him a picture. I'm like, yo, like you did this, right? Like good, like you're a part of this. Like, good job. <laughs> um, but, but that's, that's really interesting. Do you think that Brex now is more focused on customer like acquisition are they still focused on like the marketing side yeah so we're still focused on you know acquiring day one founders you know that's kind of why me my team was brought in you know start you know i've been at brex for almost a year i think i'm two weeks away from hitting one year so almost there but you know we were tasked with you know how do we engage with the startup community especially you know most of the startup community being you know what you see on twitter is early stage founders you know um you know, founders who've never been a founder before, you know, your first time founders and figuring out how do we help them, you know, achieve success for their startups and also, you know, get them into this, you know, Brex community, which, Mm. you know, we've been fostering in, you know, SF, LA, Miami, New York. So, So one thing that's interesting, again, going back to the events is that to put on an event, like there's a lot that goes into it and there's a lot of money being spent too. But I would assume that it makes up or like the LTV of a customer makes up 
uh, for how much you're spending on the event. How do you decide that, okay, out of 20 early stage founders that we have at a dinner, like this one person is going to make up for, for all of it? Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's really hard, you know, because it's like one of the biggest things about events is, you know, it's really hard to see, you know, what you said, like those initial returns right away. Or it's like, does that one founder who signs up for Brex even make up, you know, the sort of, you know, revenue for the, you know, for Brex, you know, that makes this event worth it. And we kind of measure success of event in various ways, you know, one of them being you know, the reach, you know, people will talk about Brex, you know, be like, hey, you know, this is what Brex does, you know, you should sign up. So it's like, even if like, you know, none of the people at the dinner, you know, signed up for Brex or anything, they could have told their friends and their mm. friends would sign up or something, you know, it's like this long game we're playing is, you know, I've done dinners, you know, I went to UCLA. So I've done like startup dinners with Brex at UCLA, bring in a few VCs because, you know, they don't, you know, see too many VCs or, you know, really the same thing at Berkeley as well. I did one about two months ago. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, a lot of these founders, you know, these student founders are so early, you know, their first startup could fail, you know, they could be like a great unicorn founder, you know, company three or something like that, or, you know, decide to start a company later. Brex might not be the ideal fit for them right now, but like, hopefully, the goal is, you know, they would have been like, oh, you know, I went to this Brex event. I know, you know, me and, able to, you know, go make a Brex account in the future when they're ready to. Things like that. And then really things like, you know, how do we inspire customer love? You know, we have a lot of dinners for Brex that we bring in Brex, our, you know, current Brex customers as well. And it's really to give back to them, be like, hey, thank you for being really great Brex customers. We did a billboard advertising event in New York about two weeks ago as well, which is featuring some Brex, you know, customers on a Times Square billboard for free. Oh. So it was super great. They loved it. You know, it was, hard. you know, it was, you know, we had 15 spots, you know, to showcase founders. We had literally 400 signups. So wow. it's crazy. All Brex, you know, customers. And it's like, you know, how do we inspire these customers? And hopefully, yeah. you know, we'll get all these customers a billboard spot in the future. That's the goal. Okay. So walk me through the, like the entire process of putting on an event. Yeah. So what's, what, what type of event, like, does the most planning go into? Yeah. Um. Honestly, you know, I, you know. I'll talk about, you know, I guess like, you know, these Breck supper clubs that we're doing now because those are the events that are going to be most commonly seen sure. in, you know, all these major like areas in the future. And, you know, first step is, all right, identifying like a host, you know, who's, you know, a really great host to throw this event. You know, we've done events at, you know, people's homes, you know, some people's offices as well. But it's, you know, it's like a good event space that can comfortably see, you know, 15, 20 people. For example, the last one we did was in Fort Mason at the Fort, um, Dante's, you know, for, um, house. So we brought in 25 people, had the CEO, um, Henrique, come, you know, give a few words after TechCrunch and, you know, people had a great time and it was a great event. So after we secure the host, it's like, that's, you know, honestly, that's one of the hardest parts, you know, just finding a host, yeah. you know, making sure the time schedules align and being like, all right, hey, you know, it's time to do this event. The next stop is, you know, all right, how are we going to, you know, what kind of, you know, founders, investors do we want on the list? And it's really interesting. You know, I honestly think the hardest part of that is rejecting people because there's way too many people that sign up for events. You know, every event you do, you're going to have people that want to get in that, you know, you have no spots left for. During the beginning of this, you know, we had, you know, we did like a Gen Z dinner in SF. It was like one of my first events, 20 spots. We had a hundred people sign up and I'm <laughs> like, all right, how am I going to choose this? How do you choose it? Are there yeah. any, any crazy reactions from it's, rejecting? Um, there hasn't been too, most people are really understanding, you know, okay. they're not like, you know, we, you know, it's like, oh, why didn't you choose me? All that stuff. You know, yeah. they're pretty understanding because it's like, we literally don't have spots or mm -hmm. it's like you signed up really late. You know, I try to, you know, the goal is for people that sign up for these events, I kind of remember a lot of their names. So, you know, I rejected like, you know, had an event I was planning out for like tomorrow actually. Um, and we rejected like 20 people and I'm like, all right, I can't, I don't have room this, but I have room at this other dinner mm -hmm. a month from mm -hmm. now. I'm like, sign up. I'll accept all of you guys. So it's like, you know, it's like, I want to accept people, but it's like, you know, really hard because there's no space. Yeah. But we, you know, once we get that list, it's usually like a nice mix of, you know, like, you know, say 20, you have 20 people, you know, 
on the guest list? How are you going to decide these 20? It's a mix of, you know, I like to have, you know, at least 15, 16 of these people be like, you know, early stage, you know, founders of sorts, okay. you know, like probably, you know, 60% Brex customers already, 40%, you know, not Brex customers bring them out. The rest, like four people, you know, maybe like superstar operators or like, you know, some big investors that, you know, are investing early stage to help mm. these, you know, founders and really curate it like that, you know, curate the vibes. It's like, you know, you bring in, you know, you bring in every dinner is different because, you know, the people at these dinners are always different. So the vibes are always different at these events. So it's like, how do you really curate a central vibe and let the audience, you know, take that and kind of go from there where, you know, it's a great, enjoyable, intimate dinner. You learn a lot. You meet great connections. Like, for example, we did a dinner um, a deep tech dinner. We um, had investors, had founders, and then I met this founder three months later who attended that dinner. He was like, dude, thanks for inviting me to this. I met someone who introed me to a guy who led my round and wrote, gave me $3 million. Wow. And I'm like, dude, that's insane. It's like, you know, things like that is what... And the brand loyalty. That, exactly. that goes back to Brex. It's like, you, you remember Brex is curating that experience and building that community. And then, I mean, they'll, they'll probably stick with you, but even if they don't, you created that relationship, right? Exactly. And that's kind of why we do this. Mm -hmm. What's, so, well, go, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I was going to ask, what, what's Enrique like as a founder? Yeah, he's question. great. So Enrique and Pedro, you know, they're, it's really interesting. You know, they're both co-founders and they're actually both, you know, um, co-CEOs of Rex. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't really see that too often, you know, like these co-CEO roles. But they handle it really well. You know, I haven't met Pedro in person yet, but I've met Henrique once. He's, a, you know, he's a great guy. You know, we were chatting with him. He was super down to earth, pretty funny guy, you know, um, and really had a great story to tell about, you know, like his learnings as a founder of mm. Brex to these audiences. So he's a great guy, you know. Um, hopefully I'll see him more, you know, do more dinners, um, yeah. see him more. But, you know, my first, you know, I was like definitely very nerve wracking, you know, meeting yeah. him for the first time. Being like, hey, welcome to this dinner I'm throwing. But, you know, afterwards, I'm like, okay, you know, that was great. You know, mm. um, hopefully I get him out a few more in the future. What is the onboarding when you kind of get, let's say you join Brex as an employee. Yeah. What does the onboarding actually look like? Because I would imagine a lot of thought went into that. Yeah. So um, onboarding, you know, it's, you know, I don't know what other big companies onboardings are like. Because, you know, I haven't, you know, before Brex, I was working at like a three-person, you know, venture fund. Before that was like another two-person venture fund. So it was, I guess, my first, you know, big employee onboarding experience. And I think it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's like you go in orientations, you learn about the product, you know, and you, you know, learn about, you know, you meet your teammates and all that stuff. For us, it was very interesting because our team, you know, this XIR team was pretty much started um, when I joined. So it was Shai who created the program. He mm -hmm. joined about a few months before me. And it was me, you know, Janine, who joined Brex, you know, like a week after me. So super new team where, you know, this never had been done before. What does so, that stand for, by the way? Um, it's like expert in residence. Expert in so residence. So it's like, you know, I kind of frame it as like, you know, like these like community evangelists, you know, like these entrepreneurs and residents, you know, mm. what like venture and residents look at, at like, you know, these, you know, other venture funds, bigger mm. companies. What experience did you have before coming into Brex that made you this like, fit for the XIR role? Yeah, I think really, you know, three things, you know, one was, you know, brand building, you know, I've built, you know, my TikTok, you know, at Venture Capital Guy, you know, for two years before this. I've you seen know. some of your TikToks. On the Love it. You. Yeah. Love it. But it's, you know, something that I curated for a while, you know, when I, you know, when I was at GSV, the first thing my partner told me was, you know, crafting your brand was very important. He was mm. on like, you know, your CNBCs, you know, all these talk shows. And I was like, I wonder why he's doing that. But it's, you know, your brand is important to, you know, who you are as a, you know, investor. So I basically was like, all right, you know, I'm gonna do the Gen Z version of this, make a TikTok, you know, I used to be a videographer. So and kind of see how that goes. Mm -hmm. And it did really well, you know, I built a brand on Twitter, you know, through Gen Z Scouts, you know, built this whole Gen Z, you know, founder ecosystem. Yeah. So doing all of those things, A, helped a lot. B, you know, background in venture capital. So everyone on the, you know, on this XIR team is either former VCs or former founders. So, you know, I was at GSV, which led me to just meet a lot of, you know, have a network. 
of early stage, you know, founders I knew or, you know, VCs that I knew. Because if you look at this role, you know, um, other companies also, you know, want to do something similar. You know, they want to throw events. They want to do stuff. But the issue is they don't have a network. You know, they don't have a network of, you know, loyal people or just, you know, if you're someone creating an event, you know, you don't know founders. You have to reach it out. That's why I was trying to sponsor your events, right? It's like the first thing I was like, we need Brex Mm. to bring us a network of founders because we don't have it. Exactly. It's like that. It's like, you know, a lot of, you know, we work with a lot of, we, you know, partner with a lot of companies Mm -hmm. to do this because, you know, they know we have a really great network of founders that we know and cultivate it over time. So now... I actually didn't know about the, the TikTok account, but that's yeah. really cool. So now if you want to take your background in videography and merge that with 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 this kind of industry you're in of, of venture, how would you recommend existing kind of VC funds go about branding? Would you say that events are more important? Is there online presence? Should they all make TikTok videos? Like, what do you think? Yeah, definitely not all make TikTok videos. You know, it's <laughs> like, it's, int- you know, TikTok's such an interesting, you know, I'm still trying to understand the TikTok space. You yeah. know, I think my last video got shadow banned or something. No. So uh, still trying to navigate that. But it's like, you know, it's more about authenticity. You know, how do you be really authentic in everything you do? And which is how, you know, funds win. Because it's like, oh, if you really look at it, you know, the, you know, there's so many, you know, like inauthentic accounts or anything like that, where it's mm. like, oh, you know, you don't believe the message and that's not good. You know, it's like it, you know, brand authentication doesn't happen overnight. It takes, you know, months of curating. It takes years of curating. So it's like, how do you really create that great presence? Mm. What would you say that they should be curating? Yeah, I really think, you know, for venture funds, it's, you know, your, you know, I guess market is, you know, how do you get founders to, you know, how do you get great founders? How do you get founders to be like, hey, we want to take your money to, you know, um, be a part of this, you know, journey forever. It's how do you help founders? How do you be authentic to founders? Even if, you know, you're not investing in them, you know, how do you help them with everything? And, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot as well. It's like, you know, for my, you know, I run a syndicate, you know, for my syndicate, it's like, you know, if I ever want to turn this into a fund, you know, what stuff do I want to do that's not just investing? that will help, you know, A, build the brand of the fund, but B, also help founders, which, Mm. you know, I learned a lot from Brex is, you know, doing some, you know, curated small dinners, you know, all around and really, you know, kind of going off that, you know, just really being authentic, helping founders, you know, with everything they need. Mm. I definitely want to talk about the syndicate because that's really interesting. But even before that, to to kind of stay on the current topic, now let's say you have, uh, let's say a $10 million fund, right? You have an event budget um 100k yeah and does that is that kind of like in the range of how much you would probably spend for that size of a fund yeah i think so you know um that's a hard question because you know for me it's you know i don't you know i have a syndicate so not a lot of fun you know not a lot of you know money to spend for events Mm -hmm. and you know it's a lot smaller in terms of you know i'm trying to you know spend as little as I can, get the biggest output as I can. Because, you know, at Brex, it's like, oh, you know, we want to be smart with our money. We don't want to spend on like overly crazy things. And, but for a hundred K, you know, I think if I was a fund, what I would do is, you know, go, you know, A, create these small, you know, dinners and all these different geographies that you want to focus on. Mm. Bring in founders you want to focus on and cap it off with like a, you know, a killer um, summit, you know, annual summit. That is, you know, really authentic, really great. I went to one about four months ago, um, Next Play Capital. So they're a venture fund, I think, out of, you know, San Francisco. The founder is this guy, Ryan Neese, former UCLA alum, played in the NFL. Dad is NFL Hall of Famer, Ronnie Lott. Oh, Um, oh, wow. So it's such a, and they had their Next Play Capital Summit. It was the craziest event I've been to and the most, like, I learned the most at it. It was held in Chase Center about 200 attendees and their premise is, you know, how do we, you know, A, also help athletes break into the, you know, after they're done with their playing careers, break into the field of business and tech. Oh, wow. So I learned, you know, the panels that they had was things like, you know, learning about crypto, the differences of startup investing in like Miami, you know, LA, New York, but mm-hmm. also things like building, you know, a brand as an athlete and, you know, how they transition from their careers onto, you know, um, the business world. Mm. And there was, you know, the keynote speaker was Chris Paul. Um, I met like 
were on our test medal world peace, you know, a few like US men's national soccer team players. Yeah. So it was a pretty stacked event. You know, I'm mm. a huge sports fan. So I'm like seeing all these people. I'm like, this is so cool. Mm. You're a big sports fan. We of were course. just talking yeah. about it last week about these like players who have gone to to like run investment arms. Yeah, we were just talking about with with Furkan who who runs Founders Inc. about Zaza yeah. Pachulia and how he's running the Warriors investment arm. But I always see him on the on the sideline. I was like, oh, he's yeah. a he's a coach or he's development, and he's like, no, he's 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 helping the players invest in companies. And do do you have any outlook? And I know we'll get to Gen Z scouts, yeah. um, just in terms of athletes in tech and it's become cool now to, yeah. to do this in like the next five to 10 years of what that looks like. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I'm a huge, you know, I'm a huge proponent of this space. It's like, you know, I think athlete, you know, even like creators as well, you know, the creator space, the athlete space has always slowly become intertwined with this whole tech space. Mm. You really see, you know, like Kevin Durant, you know, his venture fund has been doing really great things. And on the creator side, you see places like Animal Capital, you know, which was founded by Josh Richards. You see Anti VC by uh, Jake or Logan. I forgot which one of the Pauls. Yeah. Um. You you see like the Dixie D'Amelo, Charlie D'Amelo venture fund coming up as well. It's like you know, really. You what know, are your thoughts on those? Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. You know, it's you know, if you look at most of them, you know, there's someone who's actually been in the venture space running as running it as well. Yeah. So it's like, you know, uh, Animal Capital is run by this guy, I think Marshall um, Sandman, mm -hmm. former Goldman guy. You have, you know, uh, you know, you're looking at, you know, like the Kevin Durant funds. I'm sure he has someone out yeah. there, yeah. you know, in the background as well. But it's like, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, it's like, a, if you're a founder, especially for like the creator economy startups, you know, or like your consumer founders, you would love like a Josh Richards, you know, like an Animal Capital or Logan Paul in your round because they post a video about your product on TikTok. You know, yeah. you get so many fans free mm. marketing. But it's also really interesting as well because, you know, they're not like traditional VCs who've seen the market, who's, you know, weathered, you know, economic, you know, like disasters or economic recessions. So the whole, you know, unique prop to helping founders is mainly, you know, a lot of marketing, a lot of, you know, PR product versus that of, you know, building a company, how to hire the best people, which, you know, I feel like as, as a founder, you know, you'd want a diverse cap table, you know, getting yeah. a few mix of, you know, VCs with great superpowers. I think it's really interesting that we're starting to see a lot more people with followers start to also play the VC game. Yeah. Like if you look at like Sean Puri and Sahil Bloom, I mean, Sean Puri, obviously, yeah. like, I think he just angel invests, but yeah. Sahil Bloom, last I heard, I think he has like a rolling fund. So these guys essentially have a, not a hack, but like they have distribution down because they're probably investing in either lifestyle or like, you know, these like B2B plays where their audience mm -hmm. is also the target demographic of the startups they're funding. And if you can get to that point where it's like your audience is also the, the, the demographic, it, it almost feels like a hack because you can invest in these companies. It's almost like you're gar not guaranteed, but it's almost like you're guaranteed. Um, some type of return on that because you have their marketing figured out. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Um, I wouldn't say you have the marketing like completely figured right, out, right. but it's like, you know, you have some semblance of it. It's up to you to, you know, expand that and Definitely. grow to that series A to that, you know, locking down that product market fit. But, you know, yeah, like what you said, like Sean Perry's, you know, of the world, you know, like your Turner Novak's as well, you know, yeah. his banana cap banana capital fund you know was really a lot of it spurred by you know like his twitter and it's really great because what lps you know like to see for emerging fund managers is do you have like the brand you know like having a great brand does a few things one is you get to see more deals because more people know who you are mm. and b you know you're slightly going to be easier getting into deals because people know who you are people are, talk about you and be like oh yeah have you heard about you know, this guy, he has some really great stuff, you know, it's like, oh, if you're Josh Richards, you know, oh, he's on TikTok, you know, we got to get him on, you know, he's done something great. So you run Daydream Ventures, is that what it's called? Yeah. So do you get sourced a lot of a lot of deals through kind of your like online presence? Yeah, actually a good amount, you know, um, one of the deals that I angel invested in, you know, was a company I met on TikTok, actually of all places. Yeah. Um, you might have heard of them. It's called Copy AI. Oh, yeah. So you invested in it. Yeah. Copy wait, AI. wait, man. that's a double. Yeah, move. we've definitely heard of them. Yeah. That's good. So it was... How really, early was that? It was... So I did this December um, December 2020. So oh, about... Yeah, a while ago. Wow. 
And it was so I've heard about I heard about Copy AI like three months before that. So like yeah. probably September. Seen them on Twitter and didn't really look into them that much, but I saw them. And then I saw their founder, you know, Paul, he was like building in public, you know, mm-hmm. tweeting about building in public. And I'm like, oh, this is actually really cool. And his co-founder, Chris, who I got to know a lot better, started was doing like copy AI TikToks. And, you know, at that point, you know, December 2020, there was not a lot of VC or startup TikTokers. I literally think I was the only one out there. Um, so we connected, we chatted. And one day, you know, I was, I think it was like winter break. I was like, you know, back home and I'm like, dude, do you, you know, do you still have, are you raising, you know, do you still have money on the round? You know, he was like, yeah, we're actually doing our, you know, closing up our angel round if you want to get it. And I'm like, dude, I'm super down. So that happened, you know, great, you know, great company so far, yeah. you know, they're doing well, you know, generative AI has been just blowing up in yeah. the past. I think you it's, know. it's a unicorn, right? No, not, no. I don't think so. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully soon. Yeah. You know? yeah. Fingers crossed. But yeah. That's amazing. And c- can you talk a little more about the strategy when you start evaluating these venture companies, early stage founders specifically? Yeah, it's really, you know, it's always very different because, you know, in all these different spaces, you know, you have to evaluate different things. But I think, you know, I go, you know, what when I was at GSV, we had something called the five P's. And, you know, it's kind of guided me even after GSV on investing. It's, you know, like people, purpose, potential, you know, predictability and purpose. You know, it's like, you know, the big thing is, you know, evaluating the teams, you know, there's you know, when you talk to a founder, you know, if you're early on, you know, like you just get into VC, mm-hmm. the same case for me, you know, the first 10 founders I talked to, I'm like, dude, these guys are building unicorns, you know, these guys are going to the moon. It's because, you know, you haven't talked to enough founders yet, you know, like, I don't think any of those first 10 companies I talked to, you know, are doing well now, but yeah. it's like, once you keep talking to more and more companies, you get to, you know, understand, you know, what, you know, makes a good founder versus, you know, what doesn't make a good founder, you know, Mm. or it's like an okay founder, a company that we talked to um, and invested in, in the beginning of um, this year, actually, this company called Abstract. Um, We were a really impressed because they were building in a space that, you know, was very antiquated, you know, kind of like, you know, not nothing very much technology, you know, has been implemented in that space. They do, you know, like lobbying for, you know, making lobbying accessible for small businesses and hopefully eventually for everyday citizens. Okay. Um, and it's like collaborative software as well, which is really interesting. Talked to a lot of lawyers. They like, you know, they were like, I haven't seen this before. A lot of these Gen Z millennial lawyers like, dude, our technology is like 90, 90 stuff. Haven't used these in a while. And they're like, this is really cool. And the founders itself, they're really great. They had like the cleanest data room I've ever seen. You know, they were super on top of all their conversations you know, tracking everything, you know, uh, their sales things. And I was like, this is really cool. You know, these are like, you know, just got out of college two years ago, you mm-hmm. know, type of founders. And I'm like, all right, let's make a bet into them. You know, they raised, you know, uh, we got into the round with, I believe, like Amplify LA, Wonderco, a few other guys. So they've been doing well, you know, excited huh? for them to grow in the future. Oh, Wonderco is, is that Katzenberg? I'm not sure. Yeah. It's the, um, it's Kendrick Lamar's manager. I forgot who he was. Oh. yeah. yeah. The TDE guys? I'm not quite sure. That I'm not too familiar. Okay. But yeah. So what was like the initial like thought process behind starting Daydream? Were you already thinking of angel investing? Why did you set up an entity? Are there other people on yeah. the team with you? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, why I started this was, you know, I, you know, when I was work, you know, in venture, I was like, all right, you know, the end goal for me is I want to start my own fun one day. But to do that, it's like you have to have a really great track record. Yeah. And, you know, you don't get a track, great track record. You, you know, it's like I want to start investing in companies to kind of prove out my thesis and track record over time, which is, you know, right now we've been investing kind of in two areas. One is, you know, investing in Gen Z founders or founders building in Gen Z. Or t- really, two, it's, you know, founders building in antiquated spaces, you know, spaces that, you know, have been neglected for some time and they're mm. building something really cool in those spaces. So those are the two thesis areas I wanted to prove out, which is kind of why I started investing you know, in companies starting, you know, really starting this whole process out. And we have, yeah, like we have two people on our team, you know, um, none of us, none of this is our full-time jobs, which is really great. You know, so we do about, you know, one to two deals a quarter. Super, super, you know, we don't do too much volume, you know, we'll do company here and there. But one, you know, this guy, David, you know, and how we met is very Gen Z, you know, we met on the Gen Z VC Slack channel. When I was at GSV, when he was at this fund, um, I forgot what it was called, but 
he was at this fun and, you know, we talked, you know, we zoomed and then we eventually met up in SF mm. and he's been great. You know, he's running like, a, you know, a web three hedge fund right now doing some really cool stuff in Toronto. Other partner, um, his name's Oliver. Um, he works at a venture capital fund early stage. So, you know, we will collaborate and, you know, do a lot of stuff together, which is really great. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you know what Investopedia is? I do. Yeah, I do. It's like you can essentially, for people who don't know, it's like a, a way for you to simulate investing in the stock market and you can kind of, I guess, get your returns over time. And okay. I think I'm going to Or at least that's, that. an, that's an element of it. Um, so yeah. when we were like 15, 16, my friends and I would have these competitions where we would just essentially invest on Investopedia yeah. and, and, and see who could kind of get better returns. I think it would be really cool if someone built Investopedia for startups. I'm sure you could use Crunchbase as like a, a backend yeah. or, or not a backend, but as a, as a source of data. And I don't know if someone wants to build that. I love it. I love that you pitched a startup. I, I just it. pitched a startup. I've oh, no. seen something. I think I saw something like that. Actually. Of course. You did. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know the name of the okay. startup and this was like eight months ago. So like super, super blurry. You know, I could have been dreaming. I don't know, but I swear I saw a startup. That's like, it's like a ghost, like create your custom ghost portfolio. Mm-hmm. So you can like put startups you like, you know, like I kind of like from Crunchbase into this portfolio. Yeah. When you see them mm-hmm. and, you know, it goes over time and tracks the returns. And you can know? you like simulate valuations, amounts, all of that? I believe once it becomes public. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Like, I don't know anything. I saw like I was scrolling past Twitter when I saw this. So, so. it's a it's a no from Jonathan, but it's OK. You got to keep pitching. You okay. keep keep it, right, yeah. Jonathan? Isn't that one it. of the I things? You can't, you can't take rejection, right? It's like you got to keep going. Got to keep going. <laughs> so so one thing I, I, I'm interested to kind of hear is with all of these, with all of your background in investing, what did you do in college? Yeah, college. Um, a lot of stuff. Okay. So, um, you know, I came into college, went to UCLA as a business economics major. You know, like every other business economics, you know, finance kid, it's like, oh, I banking is the way to go. I joined this iBanking club my, you know, literally my first like five weeks on campus. And I was like, dude, I do not want to do this. It's all number crunching. You know, it doesn't feel, you know, it doesn't feel authentic. You know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I, you know, have heard of startups from my family. So one of my cousins, he's a founder of this company called uh, Party, Mucker Labs, you know, back then, you know. So, I, you know, when I was growing up, I saw him and my other cousin founded this food delivery company called Caviar that I got acquired by Caviar. Square nice. um, out of Berkeley. So those two were like kind of my big inspirations growing up. You know, that's how I heard about startups. And, you know, um, so I always kind of knew, you know, there could be something really cool in the startup space to do. But, you know, so when I went into college, you know, my sophomore year was at this place called Expert Dojo, this LA-based accelerator program. Yeah, in Santa know. Monica. Yeah, in Santa Monica. Of course. Exactly. Yeah, I know the guys down there. Okay, yeah. that's dope. So that was kind of my first start. They came to UCLA Career Fair. I pitched them and I so remember my interview, you know, yeah. sitting out in the Santa, in like the Santa Monica mall. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, doing that interview. You, you were the, you, you know, you, you've been there. I've been there. Yeah. That's the KO event. <laughs> oh, was, uh, next oh. to the cheesecake factory. In, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so. You've been there. Yeah. 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 So that was my first role. And then afterwards, you know, uh, my next role was I was working. My friend was interning there, you know, the quarter before me. Mm. And he was like, I'm leaving. You should come. And I'm like, okay. This was my first like venture internship. It was at this place called um, Pontifex Ag Tech, an agricultural venture fund. So I had no clue anything about ag tech. You know, this was like they did series A plus. So a lot of Mm. late stage deals. So I did a lot of like financial analysis, you know, reading up on stuff like, you know, soil, CRISPR technology, all that stuff that if you ask me today, I don't remember a single thing. (laughs) But it was great because it got me into, you know, venture capital got me to be like, I actually like this, you know, it's probably not the field for me, but I like the work Mm. in general. And then I actually, you know, left, you know, startups and venture, you know, because my rationale was I'm in college. I have four years. I want to explore as much as I can. Yeah. So I was a film minor in college, you know, being in LA, it's like, I love history, you know, film, you know, yeah. it's the best Me place to do it. I went to school in LA. I was also a film minor. I love it. It's, it's a, Omar it's, also has a film background. I have a film background, not a film minor. Unfortunately. <laughs> love it. And I, when I was in college, you know, all four years I was doing videography. You know, uh, would shoot for artists who came to campus at UCLA, like, you know, Miramasa, Amide, Charlie XCX, which was super, super fun. And I basically started working at Lionsgate, you know, uh, worked there. And then afterwards went to NBC Universal, 
So like my last two years of college was kind of focusing a lot on film scene if I wanted to break into film. Realized after NBC Universal, it's like, you know, they were like an 80,000 person company. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, there was one day um, during the summer, my friend was like, hey, you want to go to the beach? And I had no work to do. And I was like, okay, it's 12 p.m. You know, let me just leave. You know, mm-hmm. hopefully, you know, no one notices I'm gone. No one noticed I'm gone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, all right. And it was, you know, it was like a mix of things. Like one, I, I realized film wasn't for me. Two, you know, my manager, I had like two managers because one like got transferred. So mm-hmm. my second manager, who I worked with the most, didn't really, you know, help me grow, you know, didn't really give me anything to do because she, she was trying to figure it out herself. Sure. So I was like, you know, kind of just in a stuck place. Mm. Basically, I was like, all right, I want to go back to startups. So I basically ended, I started interning data science at this company called Yumi, a baby food company. Super, super cool. Yeah. I think they just raised their like $67 million Series B like a year ago. Wow. But like they're in Target now. Their baby food's actually really good. I would taste test that stuff. And it's like really, really good. You stuff. would taste this. Yeah. Taste test baby food. It's so good. I'm swearing. So how are you comparing it? Like what are you comparing it to? Applesauce. Like applesauce. Yeah. <laughs> oh, actually. It's like, yeah. No, literally, like applesauce. It's like it's like these mini jar containers. Ugh. And it's like, all right, this one's like butternut squash. And I kid you not, tastes like butternut squash soup. And I'm like, this is so good. Wow. Okay. Or it's like they had this blueberry pie. You know, not every flavor was good, but they had yeah. like this blueberry pie one that was really, really good. So um, you can vouch for the squash, the blueberry pie. Yes. So, Which one did you hate? They had some kale one. I think they had a kale one that no, I didn't no like. No baby should yeah. be eating that. So, you know, yeah. or like Unless the beets. The beets. The beets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, nice. but. Everything else was really, really good. Huh. And it's, you know, it was, you know, it was a great experience. You know, doing data science. I was like, all right, I want to do this post grad. I don't want to okay. do anything else. Yeah. COVID hits and they're like, hey, you know, we don't have a role for you anymore because, you know, no. uncertain times, you know. And I'm like, all right, I got three months before I graduate to figure out what I want to do. You know, got lucky, ended up at a merging fund called Good Am Ventures. Did that for a few, you know, six months ish. Then transitioned to GSV and now where I am at Brex. Wow. What are you doing as an early or a recent grad at a venture? Like what is your day-to-day work? Yeah, a lot of it. You know, I guess, you know, when I was at, you know, Good I Am Ventures, which was like my first role, it was an emerging fund. And I honestly, you know, I have a lot of calls with kids on, you know, like BC, like breaking into BC. I tell them, go to emerging fund. They because you get to experience so much more than just, you know, sourcing, doing mm-hmm. due diligence, you know. You do everything from creating letters for LPs, you know, seeing what the raising a fund looks like, as well as the stuff like helping portfolio companies, you know, taking ownership of actual stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really interesting. A lot of, you know, when I was at Good AM, it was a lot of, you know, due diligence since we had a lot of good deals. You know, we had a lot of companies sourced to us. It was a lot of due, you know, a lot of due diligence on companies we would look to invest in. Helping, you know, LP support with, you know, our fundraise and everything. So that was really fun. And when I went to GSV, it was a little bit different. So when I was at GSV, you know, we raised a SPAC. You know, it's called the Class SPAC. If you look it up, um, I believe it was like a two hundred twenty-five million dollar ed tech SPAC. Yeah. So a lot of my time was spent, you know, doing, you know, like working on the SPAC doing due diligence. SPACs kind of died after, they, right? Yeah, they're after done. COVID. They're done yeah. for. SPACs are done for. Um, at that time, it was like, you know, SPACs were hot. You know, it was yeah. like the Chamath SPACs. And yeah, all that yeah. Stuff. <laughs> so it was really interesting just taking a look at that space. Mm. Um, and then we also ran something called GSV Bootcamp, which was like this accelerator program where we help early stage founders. You know, really, you know, it's like an eight week program to help early get stage founders, you know, be able to, you know, start raising. So that was really fun and a little bit different than what traditional VCs do. Yeah. But, you know, it was a great time overall. And, you know, I would not trade it for the world. Mm. So so one thing that I'm kind of curious about is what is the salary or like, what does the structure look like when you work at a fund? Because I'm assuming you're not getting yeah. equity in all the companies you're invested in. Oh, depends. You know, it depends company by company. You know, there are, com- you know, there are funds I t- know where if you're an analyst, you know, associate, you do get some carry. You know, um, you what do, is carry? Um, so carry is basically, what carry is, is when you're a venture fund, They really operate on the principle of two and twenty, two being management fees. You know, for the life, you know, for the life of the fund, you get two percent of whatever that AUM is, and that pays like your salaries, the legal stuff, and all that structure. And the twenty is the carry, which is whatever the fund makes in profit. The VCs, you know, the general partners will take that twenty percent of carry. So it's pretty, you know, 
if you're, you know, in order to be a rich VC, you just got to hit some home runs, you know, and get that carry. You know, you don't make it big off management fees. You make it big on carry. And, you mm-hmm. know, it's 20%. So usually it's like what, you know, if you have two partners, you know, you split it, what, 10, 10. But if you have an associate analyst and you're like, okay, we want to give them a little bit of carry. You know, I've seen like, you know, uh, 0.5%, you know, like 0.25%, you know, yeah. super small amounts of carry. So they get a little bit of the pie. But it's usually not a lot. It's not life changing, you know. Mm. Um, but you know, some funds do get carry. I never got carry, you know, when I was there, so you know, is, I didn't really see that. Is there a really long vesting schedule then on the carry? That I'm not sure. Okay. Um, just because I never got carry right. as okay. a VC, so, but I would assume it's you know on the deals that you've done. So it's like, oh, whatever deals you were there for, you know, you get carry for that portion. So how is Daydream Ventures kind of structured? Is it structured like that? Yeah. So it is structured like that. So for us, it's it's a lot easier structured okay. because, you know, it's, you know, carried on who does the, you know, who does the deal. So since we have three partners, you know, there's sometimes where one partner is super busy. So, you know, we just split the carry, you know, 10%, 10%. Gotcha. Or others, if, oh, all three partners are involved, it's, you know, like what, 6.67 times three. And it's super easy. So, yeah. And so it's carry per deal. So each investment has its own carry. Yeah. And then when does that get triggered? Is it like after an exit? Yeah. After an exit event, um, you know, you'll see the returns or it's like after acquisition, you know, you might not see returns, but you get like, you know, like stock, you know, in a private company sure. that you still can't exercise. Interesting. Yeah. You can't sell secondaries of a, a VC fund, can you? Um, secondaries of a venture fund? I don't believe so. No. I'm not sure. I don't think pitching so. a second yeah. startup idea too? That's... <laughs> It's a, it's a, it's a weird he already day. said no. I, it was raining. It's just a weird I've, day, man. I've heard, though, there's like, you know, you can take loans out, like collateral, like uh, loans on your future carry. Um, No clue how it works. I've read it on Twitter. Adam so Newman. not even know how true it is. Okay. That's what Adam Newman did. No? Pro- I think so. Right? Yeah, he took probably. out the loans on the... Yeah. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Do you... You know about free ventures at Berkeley? Yeah, I do. I did a Brex event with oh, them. Oh, that was with them. Yeah. That's dope. So do you, I don't know if other colleges have an equivalent. I would imagine at Berkeley, if you want to get into investment, you would kind of go through a club like that. Yeah. In other colleges or even outside of college, if I want to get into venture as like my full-time job after college, what do I have to do in college? Dude, it's hard. You know, I was talking to my friend about this, you know, he joined, you know, a venture fund about like a year ago. And he was like, when I was applying for VC roles, there was literally, you know, I got, he got the job. But there was a thousand applicants. Wow. And it's like, how are you going to, you know, it's like, how do you stand out over a thousand applicants? And sometimes the answer is you got to get lucky, you know? Actually. And the biggest thing was, you know, your Berkeley's, your Stanford's of the world, they have great entrepreneurship ecosystems for kids. You know, like I see, you know, like your Harvard's, your Northeastern's actually, UCLA's, you know, they have like some really solid ones as well. Yeah. But for a lot of kids, you know, especially in like middle America, you know, smaller state schools. There's not a lot of venture opportunity for them, you know, like their club's entrepreneurship ecosystem might be really small or they might have one, but it's just very disconnected from what Silicon Valley is. So, you know, the companies that they look for or they, you know, found are very different than what traditional Silicon Valley investors want to see. Mm. And it's like, how do you bring these students into the fold? You know, how do you bring these students, you know, get diverse students from all backgrounds, from all parts of America, you know? into venture or you know into startups and that's a hard question i don't think anyone solved it yet yeah fully um because you still see disparities you know it's like what 50 percent of all vcs graduate from stanford or harvard from either a bachelor's or a master's program yeah and it's like how do you solve that and it's like more access to programs like you know what dormant fund has done you know what dormant um website. rough draft ventures I think Contra used to have a fellows program. I don't know if they still have one, but what Contra is did, you know, what I'm doing with Gen Z Scouts is helping students, you know, figure out ways to break into startups, into venture. Yeah. So I guess one thing uh, or an idea, I don't know how, how viable this is, but a lot of these, these funds have a lot more than just the investment aspect, right? Like there's the branding, the marketing. How feasible would it be for me to send a cold email? Let's say I want to get into a fund. I'm a kid in the middle of nowhere. I send a cold email saying, look, I'm going to do all your marketing. I'll start a TikTok for you, whatever it is. How easy would it be for me to go from that to then joining the analyst side? Yeah, honestly, you know, I've seen really interesting ways, you know, if the if that kid, you know, got an email back from them and, you know, the partner liked them, I would assume it's definitely a lot easier. You know, your chances skyrocket, you know, from like 0.1% to actually like, you know, I would say like 40, 50% if there's an opening, you know. 
I like talking, you know, I love talking to really, you know, these kids, you know, breaking into venture. But a lot of them are the same. It's just kids wanting to learn about the industry. And I'm like, hey, this is what you do to break in. And a lot of them don't follow through. That's the biggest thing. It's like you don't follow through with, you know, these breaking into ventures. For me, I like try to take as many, you know, emails as I can with students. So it's like if a kid was like, hey, I'll do your TikToks, I'll do your marketing, you know, I would be like, let's talk. Love to see some writing sample, like some samples. And if they do well, I'm bringing them in. I'm super down. So what you're saying is if someone wants to break into VC, they should reach out to hit you. Me, hit me up. <laughs> I'm super down. Yeah. That's interesting. So one thing we, we want to start doing is these rapid fire rounds. So I'm going to ask you a question. Perfect. You got one sentence, two sentences. Perfect. Okay. What is the best advice you've ever received about investing? That's a good one. Um, the best advice is don't be attached to any one company for a long time. You know, there's companies that if you're attached to, you don't see the flaws. And that's what I did early on in my investing career. I, every company I saw was like a unicorn. And I'm mm. like, how do you differentiate? That? And what's the worst advice? Ooh, the worst advice I've ever gotten in investing. I've seen a lot, you know, I've seen a lot of VCs be like, you know, I can predict the future. You know, this is where the industry is going, but you really can't, you know, there are so many VCs out there that I saw, you know, invest in companies. I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't, I wouldn't use this as a user. Wonder why they're investing in this. They fail. From an investing or from a networking perspective, which book has changed your life the most? Oh, that's a really, really good question. I think Venture Deals is a really great book, you know, especially for people who want to break into venture or even founders. You just learn about the terminology because that's the biggest thing. And then what's the best thing you ever did for yourself in college? Join as many clubs, meet as many people as I can. I wasn't worried about grades. You know, I was worried, you know, about joining some very interesting clubs, stuff, stuff that didn't apply to career stuff and just having a great experience. That's all it's about. Well, I have a startup to pitch. Oh, no. Love it. Let's Did I go. not do enough of that? I, I think this one's going to be good. We've been talking about events, right? And, and how, to, how to build that, the vibes in the room. This might exist. But let's say, you know, you're doing a dinner, 15, 20 people. It, me and Omar come in. Yeah. We have planned like conversational talking points. We we know we we have profiles of everyone in the room. We know how to start relevant conversations with everybody. And then if you need us to, we'll like make a scene. We'll do something crazy. We will. Well, oh, in the room, uh, like I'll pitch you something and you'll fund it in the room. Will and I? everyone would be like, oh my god, like these events are crazy. Like this oh. guy just got funded. Why is that not a bad idea? I feel like that would actually work. That's an it's an interesting. Have idea. you heard that? Is that a thing? That's the I, ha opposite I of haven't heard of it, but it's like you know that's definitely something like you just hit your boy up and be like, hey, come to this event. Here are the people. Yeah, go talk to them versus an actual company. Yeah, have you done that before? No, no. never. We we spent like half the episode talking about authenticity and Vishal's yeah. like, okay, here's how <laughs> we pretend to invest in someone. Well, it's like maybe we don't have to pretend. <laughs> So now we're really investing. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's like maybe That's it doesn't have to be a company. Can you just invite us somewhere and we'll help? <laughs> Vishal needs friends. <laughs> Bring the vibes. <laughs> well, actually, let's get to that. Okay. I don't think we got to that. Backtracking. Like, let's say, you know, I, I'm new to San Francisco. You guys grew up here. Uh, when you're moving somewhere, a new city, building a new network, it could be college, it could be out of college, new job. How do you how do you start from scratch mm -hmm. and and go about that? You're obviously the right guy to ask. It's a, that's a really good question. I've been trying to figure this out myself when I moved here because I'm like, shit, all my friends here are tech and startup founders. I'm like, that's great, but. I've been like, all right, I need friends outside of the startup world, yeah. which I'm slowly trying to, you know, accomplish and claw in over time. Yeah. And it's very, you know, things like, oh, you know, I've, I'm doing this thing called Volo Sports. I don't know if you've heard of it. No. In San Francisco, it's like, you know, there's like these, you know, um, different sports like flag football, basketball leagues, all that stuff. So yeah. I joined a basketball league. I knew three people. We all formed a team together. They brought in like seven other guys. So it's super fun. You know, oh, you dude. told me about this before. I think when, when we had first met about like founder basketball tournaments or something. A little bit different. A little bit different. So yeah. I started Volo literally two weeks ago. Oh, wow. So super cool. It's very interesting. Dude, literally our first game, we had the ref try to fight, fight the scoreboard operator. What? Crazy scenes. The here. ref yeah. trying to Why? So um, like we called a timeout and you know, you're supposed to stop the clock. 
Yeah. Uh, the scoreboard operator didn't stop the clock. The ref was like, hey, you know, you got to stop the clock, you mm. know. And the scoreboard operator was like, got up and was like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> uh, we literally had it like, okay. And the thing was, it was not a fair fight. The ref was like, you know, this, you know, like 20, 30 year old, like built dude. And yeah. the scoreboard operator was like this, like 70 year old old man. Oh my God. And oh my. we literally had to like physically restrain them from like fighting each other. They were like yelling at them the whole time. And I'm like, bro, what the hell is this? God damn. Sports. You either sports. make friends or break Woo. your bones. <laughs> and then that's, so is that all sports? That's all. So that's all like that. You know, Volo is all sports, you know, doing a lot of these events. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I try to, you know, still keep in contact with a lot of my college friends. Yeah. Because, you know, they all have friends that they know that are not in tech or anything. It's always great hanging out with them and just meeting new people. Yeah. But it's the age old question. Of it's like, you know, it's like, all right, meeting people on Twitter, you know, is super easy. You know, I can do that. But it's like out of, say, 50 people you meet. One of them or two of them could actually be genuine connections that you know. You're like, yo, let's hang out on the weekend over yeah. time. You know, it's hard because, you know, you have, you know, SF's really interesting where it's like you have tech acquaintances yeah. and then people you actually hang out with, even if they were not in tech, which mm. is very hard. And it's, you know, I don't think a lot of people in this space have figured out how to do that yet. Because, because LA is so different. LA is so different. Like it's so different. And the, and the, and the tech scene is, you know, you have your Silicon Beach. And then you have film and media. Then you have the influencer kind of crowd. Exactly. But it's such an interesting culture clash because you went to school at UCLA yeah. and then and then you came here. Exactly. It's always so interesting. It's like nerve wracking meeting new people. It's like you know the best you know way to do this is you know send me to some city I've no, that I know no one like Cincinnati or like you know yeah. Cleveland and be like all right you got a year to make some friends you know that shit's hard I'm wait like, is that is that a reality show it could be. hey that's wait a, that, a minute. that would be fun that would be really fun to do like a does it have to be like a tech founder or can it just no, be anyone? anyone i think this is a problem huh. everyone has you know it's like like, like zero like square one square like you just one, you get you an apartment it's called, called square one <laughs> oh man and then they have a year so they have we have to give them some tangible goal right it has to be something a year. What's the tangible goal? Okay, I think this is like the ultimate test of like you know friendship. It's yeah, going on a vacation. Ooh. A year to go to like you know. All right, let's go to like Europe together. So like a group of friends, one friend. How a group of friends, like three or more. Wow. So 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 in a year you have to move somewhere. No, nobody. And find three people who will go to find Europe like with you. three people yeah. that will go on a European vacation. I think that that's a yeah. great concept. This is why we're like we have that film background. I think we just came up with something. I love it. Now let's we, make it happen. I, let's I'm find gonna, some people. I'm going to pitch it to Daydream. Oh yeah, uh, and see what they say. We'll, we'll send you a check in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I met my like my, my current like my best friend on TikTok a year and a half ago. Wow. He put out a video, and I don't know why people actually know. I know why more people don't do this, but he put out a video <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> it's it's not bad. He put out a video on TikTok, and he was like, "I'm this old. I go to this school. I'm this like a little bit about him." I'm looking for friends. I've seen this. Yes. Yeah, and so wow. he was in USC. This is after I had applied to USC and my dream school was, was USC's like IYA program. And so I was like, okay, he's, he goes to USC. He's Muslim. He seems cool. I'm going to reach out. The first time I ever met him, I slept at his parents' house for a week. Like they just gave me their guest bedroom. Really? Um, wow. And we, we went on like a helicopter tour. Mm. We, we went, I don't even know what we did. We did. We got a, a couch and we just <laughs> put it. <laughs> There's so much... <laughs> Okay, there's a really, you know, the couch inside joke, I'm just not going to explain it. Let's but, not do that. But yeah. but basically, we got a couch and we put it in the middle of USC's big, busiest intersection. Wow. And we had his his uh, his freshman roommate sit on the couch. We had people hold up paintings behind him. We got oh, popcorn, did, yeah. right? And we just sat and we sat in the middle of the intersection and just took pictures. It was like college commitment photos. But but where I was going with this was, it's like, if more people just put those videos of them outside on TikTok. Yeah. That's actually, I don't know if that's like net positive for the world. That's probably, but really his thesis is like it, it's all person to person. If if you thrive in that environment and mm -hmm. you personally want to authentically yeah. do that, it, do anything, right? Yeah, just maybe don't get kidnapped. Don't let people stay at your house for a week. <laughs> it's not a good idea. I guess that's like a vacation. You kind of cross that one oh, off yeah. the list. The yeah. zero First time I met him. <laughs> it's also really interesting because it's like, you know, it's like you don't. It's just strangers. Like you don't know what they're like or anything like that. You're like, all right, fingers crossed. They turn turn out decently normal, not a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like now I FaceTime yeah. the guy like every day for like an hour. That is interesting. It is something. Wow. <laughs> Love it. Good yeah. for you. Luckily, you're still alive and here. <laughs> yeah. And that, you can do this podcast. That's the only reason I'm alive. 
I think you're a big, you're a big UCLA guy, right? Big UCLA. Basketball. Guy. Basketball, football. You know, we're doing well. We're both ranked. We're ranked top ten in both sports this year. Give me, is, give me a prediction for UCLA basketball, dude. NCAA title or bust, you know. Title or bust. Title or bust. It's our year. You know, we went Final Four, what, two years ago. We yeah. went Sweet 16 this year. We got two five-star recruits coming in. Amari Bailey and this Amari other guy. Amari Bailey, yeah. Adam Bonena, but Sierra Canyon. You Sierra, know Sierra Canyon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Drake dated his mom. What? Yeah. Oh, that guy. Yeah, Drake, I know about Drake dated his mom. He was friends mom. with one of my, he's yeah. friends with the guy I just Drake told you guys about. Drake dated his mom? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's weird. But... I have no comments. <laughs> We're we're looking good. We got the best what power forward in the league. We got the best uh, point guard in the nation. So Tiger you know, Campbell's Tiger the best Campbell. Player. Okay, Dude. I'm a high cast player of the Jaime year. I'm a high cast player of the year. Maybe exactly. Juzang's gone though. Juzang's gone. Okay. Yeah. You guys are better than you used to be. Yeah. Oh, dude. When I was in, when I, my four years at UCLA, our football team was terrible every year. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, the chosen one, Josh Rosen, you know, oh, uh, who every year you're like, he's going to win. A, people are like, he's winning Heisman. Yeah. You know, that Texas A&M comeback game, you know, I was yeah. like, all right, UCLA is going to, you know, be really good. And then we yeah. just sputtered out. And he's out of the, he's what, out of the league already in the NFL. Who's going to win the NCAA title? Uh, football. Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I like Georgia. I like Georgia's odds. You know, they beat Tennessee like yesterday, so or yeah. Saturday. So mm. I like them a lot. Okay. Okay. Well, so he's we have predictions for he he said Georgia's gonna win the football Georgia. playoff and UCLA's gonna win the basketball playoff. Yeah. So you guys can go to his Twitter and hate on him exactly. if that doesn't happen. <laughs> Is that all the startups we have to pitch today? I think we did a good job of, you did. of pitching them. It was some good startups. Yeah, yeah we so. have some good ones. And he's he's going to use us I, anytime he needs us, right? So, oh, so if, we need dinner invite now. If you, here's the thing. If you're kind of on the fence about an event or you're like, I don't know how this one's going to go, a new concept. Just ask him around to come what, in and just start some beef. Whatever we need to do to get this done, to make people remember. And we'll just, we'll, you know what? We'll just come in, stand in the center and scream Brex. <laughs> You'll I do love that. it. I love it. You guys are hired. Awesome. Where can people find you online? People can find me on TikTok at, at Venture Capital Guy or on my Twitter. I use my Twitter a lot. I'm pretty much there every day. Um, at the Chang J. So the Chang J. Yeah. Awesome. Well, all thanks right. everyone for listening. If you got this far, leave a like, comment, subscribe, all the YouTube things, and we will see you next week. Peace. Peace.